today we've got Craig Thorley and um, Alfie Stanley from IPPR to talk about um, what think tanks are, what they do, and how you can work for one. So, yeah, round of applause. and the rest of the Think Tank Society. Uh, my name is Craig Crawley. I'm a researcher at IPPR, which is the Institute for Public Policy Research. Uh, we're an independent think tank, not aligned to any political party, and uh, we conduct original research into a whole range of topics. Uh, we were formed back in 1988 by a guy called James uh, Cornford. Um, so you can imagine, around 1988, uh, there was a big feeling amongst uh, James and his colleagues that there needed to be a new vehicle for coming up with um, interesting, progressive ideas that could make their way into uh, the policy-making process. That was the kind of original impetus behind IPPR. Uh, we're based in Westminster, where most think tanks are based. Uh, you know, other think tanks include uh, Policy Exchange, uh, the Centre for Social Justice, Demos, um, uh, the Resolution Foundation. These are some of the main ones that you might have heard of. And they uh, conduct research into a range of topics. Some are specialists, uh, so some might concentrate particularly on economics or particular issue. Uh, IPPR covers a whole range of issues, so we have um, teams that are consistent. We have about 40 to 45 members of staff, um, so that consists of research staff primarily, but then we also have people that uh, solely um, work towards putting on events. We have uh, communication staff and obviously also uh, operational staff. And we are also unique in that we have um, a northern branch. We have IPPR North, which is based up in Manchester. Uh, and until very recently, we also had some people in Newcastle. Um, and the people up there kind of concentrate mostly on uh, kind of decentralisation uh, and uh, like regional devolution within England. So a lot of the ideas that have come out recently around um, building kind of northern cities as economic powerhouses and a lot of the arguments about HS2 and now HS3, they're the kind of things that um, IPPR might be up to. But at IPPR proper, we have um, six or so teams, which our researchers are divided up into. So they are the politics and power team, which concentrate on uh, political reform, uh, devolution, <coughs> democracy, kind of slightly theoretical uh, components. Then we have the public services team, which I'm a member of. So we concentrate on health and social care, education and uh, criminal justice. Then we have the work and families team. So they do a lot of work on uh, childcare. They've had some really big wins lately with really setting the agenda around childcare. Uh, <coughs> And they also do some stuff to do with jobs and skills. Then we have the economy team, which does what I'm sure you can imagine it does, lots of tax and spending and that kind of thing. Uh, we have the energy and climate change team. So it was a really busy period for, for that team in particular last year when um, Ed Miliband announced the, the labour price freeze at the Labour um, at the Labour uh, <coughs> meeting, and finally the Migration and Communities team. So they deal with uh, community cohesion and immigration, and uh, so they're obviously having a lot, a lot of work going on as well at the moment. Uh, so that was uh, Nick Pierce who saw the speaking there, who's our director, he's absolutely brilliant. He used to be uh, a director for policy at number 10 down the street when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister. Um, so yeah, he's absolutely brilliant. Uh, me and Alfie will just talk for a little bit more about what a think tank is and what it does, and uh, then we'll get into a bit about us and how we came to work in the think tank and maybe a few tips. Uh, so yeah, IPPR, we conduct research into a range of areas, and our explicit aim is to influence policymakers. That's why we're based in Westminster, a uh, short walk from Parliament, um, that's our explicit kind of model and aim is to 
is to come up with policy recommendations that we can feed into politicians <coughs> and policy makers with the aim of them uh, taking them on. So we have kind of goals for us are divided between kind of immediate quick wins. So this might be if we were to release a, a or in an ideal world, we'd release a, a report which has a series of recommendations and all the parties would say, yeah, that's brilliant, we're going to stick that in our manifesto. It doesn't happen very often, but that's the, that's the kind of dream. But then there's also more uh, slow-burning um, kind of uh, agenda setting. So we might release a series of reports that are, are kind of similar in their, in their overall theme and that have individual policy recommendations within them. Um, and it might be the case that, you know, uh, they don't get onto the news very much. You know, politicians aren't necessarily sticking their hand up and saying, uh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But it kind of sets a, a, a slow burning agenda and changes the tone of the debate. And if we can do that over time, that's um, kind of equally important to us. Um, so our aim when we're doing research is to kind of or the way that we do it is to try and, in the first instance, extract as much information as we can from uh, experts, range of stakeholders, uh, get that information from them and then combine that with our own uh, original analysis and ideas to come up with uh, research that we, we stick into reports um, uh, in the most instances. But Alfie can talk a bit more about the specifics of the, the research process. Great. Um, yeah, I think I think the best way to think about what a, a, a think tank is is it it sits in between universities, academia, and the policy space. So politicians and all the um, special advisors politicians have. So think tanks basically they are um, you know taking academic research, <coughs> disseminating it, and then also adding to it their own original research. And then basically we provide the access for those ideas to get into the policy space and so through consultation with uh, other policy experts we can start to make these ideas actually take a real force um, in government. Um, Craig talked about that and he mentioned a few of the um, uh, things we talk about, you know, what type of research we do. Um, I'll just kind of start from the, from the end and go back if you like. So I'll start with what our outputs are, what it is that we actually produce. Um, we've got, as Craig mentioned, a kind of classic report, it's like an old fashioned kind of um, 10,000, 20,000 word document which will set out a whole series of research and then, you know, ideally really well thought out policy recommendations. So in that sense, our work is both analytic and prescriptive. So, you know, we kind of have that academic side where we are just analysing kind of trends, developments and all sorts of different spheres and then we're prescribing, so we're saying, you know, we're trying to be creative and how, what can we do, what are the problems out there? What can we do to resolve them? So yeah, classic output is the kind of 10,000, 20,000 word paper. And as Craig said, that can either be kind of one-off reports that address an important issue that's come up, that we feel is important, fills a niche, or they can <coughs> take place, they can be part of a longer, broader theme, which might have a more philosophical or normative framework behind it, which will develop and then have a series of reports, which will, in other words, will, will kind of set out a theory and then put into that into policy examples with a number of papers. A recent example of that was um, our um, reports, uh, Condition of Britain, which went over about one and a half years. It was seen as a kind of a post-2010 election. Let's look at what is Britain's social fabric. Let's get out there, talk with as many people as possible. Let's get outside of the Westminster bubble. And then from that, we had a series of reports covering all manner of um, basic social policy reform. Um, but we are also kind of working hard to really diversify our outputs because um, <coughs> not, like, not everyone, in fact, not many people want to read a report. Um, so we, um, we've got lots of new digital outputs, videos, um, shorter things, um, animations and interactive stuff. Um, we do a lot of blog writing. So, and that's something um, the IPPR do a bit differently to some other think tanks in that we don't host our own <coughs> blogs. So we don't have a blog page um, other than for um, Nick Pierce director. We tend to get our blogs published in, um, in, the, in the media. So we, it's another kind of tool for getting ideas out in a snappy way to try and start doing some agenda setting. Um, and we also have a, an academic journal as well, called uh, Juncture. And that's very useful because, again, it kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a crucial part of um, 
that niche that we fill in terms of going into academia and going into the policy space. So we've got this academic journal which keeps up our relationship with academia, we bring in new academics, we also contribute to it, and it really helped as a, as a resource. <coughs> um, we do both quantitative and qualitative research. We try and have a, an even balance of expertise throughout the organisation, so we've got internal capacity to do all sorts of different types of interesting um, research. Um, a lot of the um, stuff we might, you know, we'll do things going from uh, focus groups where we'll go, like for example, one project on the go at the moment is looking for childcare. We'll go out and we'll talk to um, uh, parents that are currently using childcare all across London. Um, and then we'll also do things like we'll go into ONS data for employment and we'll, and we'll start doing kind of, you know, aggregate level um, uh, economic analysis as well. So really we do try and cover a, really, a real breadth of um, research methods. Um, I won't talk much on this, I'll just give like a, an example of a, of a piece of work where um, kind of your, your typical kind of phases of an IPPR report will be an initial um, sit down, decide where the, the niche is in terms of policy, how does it fit into our uh, normative framework, our ideals, our values. Um, we'll start to kind of sound out what's been done in that area already, very much like if you do a lit review for a dissertation, something similar to extend a period of time of really sounding out what's out there. Um, then you start to develop the, the niche for original research, you start to develop that very <coughs> qualitative or qualitative. And at that point you're beginning to start that policy recommendation. So you're thinking, you know, this is great, this is you know, what's new, what we're finding out is new, but what does it mean for policy? <coughs> How can we actually do something about it? Um, and at that point you might want to start bringing in other policy makers. So you'll have maybe an informal or formal round table to bring in people from political parties, from civil service, from academia, from the private sector, third sector stakeholders, and they can all come in and we'll discuss ideas. And it's one of the most useful things actually is just you know getting out and just talking to as many people as possible. And then from that you'll basically you'll have your complete report which you'll write up and um, with your kind of new research, policy recommendations, and as created in an ideal world, every single one of them gets put into um, gets put in place by government. Um, so I think I've had over to Craig just to uh, talk a bit about how he got into IPPR, how, how we got there, and then I'll, I think after I'll do the same. And then you can ask us questions before it gets more interesting. Yeah, so I will just add one thing to um, what Alfie was saying there. So when we, when we launch our reports, um, we also aim to, so the researchers will write the report, launch the report, then that's when the events team normally kick into action. So quite often when we launch a report, we'll have uh, a big event where we'll invite politicians or other interesting people to speak. Um, we'll invite uh, members of the public or, uh, for example, we published a report earlier in the year on social work. So we invited uh, many members of the social work profession and community uh, just to kind of get as many people talking about it on the day of the launch as possible. Um, and then the comms team as well, they're the kind of third strand, so research, events, comms. Comms team kick into action, so we have a, a Twitter page, um, which lots of people follow, so there'll be lots of action on Twitter building up to the uh, launch of the event. You might have uh, an article in a, in a national newspaper talking about this new research that's coming out, and it will have kind of headline statistics or arguments that the, the report has come up with. Um, so through that kind of triangulated method of report, comms and events, that's how we aim to have kind of maximum impact uh, when a report first launches. And then we aim to kind of keep that momentum going for as long as possible uh, with the ultimate aim of influencing policy makers. So yes, that's, uh, that's IPPR in a nutshell, who we are and what we do. Um, me personally, I am uh, I'm 24. I graduated in 2011 from the University of Manchester, the PPE. Um, and then I went straight from that into a master's at King's in, uh, it's called Global Ethics and Human Values. So it's a course about, um, it's kind of a combination between political philosophy and international politics uh, and then I didn't really have a, a kind of a career plan set out uh, I didn't really uh, know what I wanted to do I still don't particularly have a, a big career plan 
So I ended up on a, a, a graduate scheme that's fairly new called Charity Works. Uh, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with the kind of Teach First graduate scheme model, but it's Charity Works is based on Teach First. So it, it aims to get uh, kind of top graduates from Russell Group Universities into um, charities and non-profits. So it partners up with about 50 or so uh, charities and non-profits around the country. And the idea is that if you get onto the, the scheme, you're placed at one of those charities for a year. And it's kind of um, straight, into the, straight into the thick of it, learning on the job for a year. So I ended up at a housing association in uh, North London. So this was in 20, 2012, 2013. So this was when all of the bedroom tax stuff was kicking off, uh, all the welfare reform stuff. Um, so I kind of found myself um, in the midst of kind of devising a, you know, a welfare reform strategy for this uh, housing association. So it was a really, really interesting year. And um, I didn't necessarily know anything about housing before or have any huge interest in getting into housing, but uh, housing is actually quite a good um, cross-cutting kind of sector to see a lot of different issues going on at once. So welfare reform, you know, unemployment, uh, benefits and kind of community cohesion and it's a real microcosm for a lot of these issues so it's a really uh, kind of fascinating year. Um, <coughs> in terms of getting into think tank work, I always kind of knew that I, I'd been to a few of these kind of events when I was at uni and I knew that, I knew roughly what a think tank was and that it would seem like an interesting place to go and work um, and it's not until the the year of my graduate scheme was kind of coming to a close and I was thinking what am I going to do next. I really started looking into think tanks, looking into what they did, looking into the different types of think tanks that they were, that they were <coughs> seeing which um, really aligned most with my uh, kind of political outlook. Uh, and IPPR came up, um, applied for the job in the public services team and uh, ended up getting it. So I've been at IPPR since uh, September last year, it's just over a year now, um, and absolutely love it. It's uh, probably the best things about working in a think tank are the the feeling that you're right in the, the thick of things. So we're we're in Westminster, we're a stone's throw from Parliament. Um, you know we have we have kind of politicians and. Uh, kind of key people from all different sectors of society coming in um, and meeting with all of our colleagues all of the time. Uh, there's a constant, constant flow of really high quality research into, and it, it's difficult to keep up with everything that's going on, um, but uh, you know, you have to make a real effort to kind of keep on top of the different outputs that are coming out and so you can see the kind of connections between uh, work that's going on in different teams. So it is, it's a truly fascinating place to be, and, um, and if I was thinking about um, kind of tips and hints, I suppose, uh, it would be to, to ha if you wanted to work in a think tank, I think the most important thing is to, um, to have an idea of the connection between kind of intricate, detailed, uh, you know, policy, individual pieces of policy that might on their own seem fairly unimportant or mundane. So for example, I've been doing a piece of work recently on, on mental health services and some of the kind of individual policy recommendations and things that you work on day to day are quite a fairly, you know, fairly bland or fairly uh, uninspiring on their own. But if you can keep in mind the, some sense of a, a grand narrative or a bigger picture and think about how these individual things together, so in the mental health example, these individual things come together to, to tell a story about what we think uh, a public servant should be doing. So a public servant should be able to build, build relationships with people, so imagine a social worker or a uh, a housing worker, a neighbourhood officer, someone like that. 
they should be free from excessive bureaucracy and admin, they should be uh, able to build long-lasting relationships with individuals and communities. That's the, that's the kind of grand narrative that informs the, the intricate individual policies. And then above the grand narratives, you have again a, a meta-narrative which is, uh, you know, it's important to have social cohesion, it's important to have, uh, you know, minimal inequality, these kind of meta-narratives. And if you can keep in mind, if, if any of you ever have an interview at a think tank, if you can combine a kind of commitment to really the nitty-gritty of detailed policy work and spending hours in front of a computer reading boring policy documents and doing equations with an understanding of the real big picture, then uh, I think you're on to all Uh, so yeah, how did I, how did I, I'm, I'm also 24, um, I've only been working <coughs> properly at IPPR since the beginning of last month. So I, I actually I got in via an internship, so I was working for three months at the beginning of the year. <coughs> then I went away travelling, I was working abroad for a bit, and then came back in September. Um, my route in, I, I did a, an undergraduate degree in history in uh, King's College London, and then I did a master's in public policy. I kind of, when I was doing my degree in history, I don't know if there's any other history graduates here, but I was kind of thinking, you know, Jesus, what does is, what is that actually go into? What can I do with a history degree? So I kind of started um, thinking about that and thinking, you know, I was interested in, in economics and economic policy um, without wanting to be an, uh, an economist, per se. So I um, kind of geared history towards economics, economic policy, then applied to do a master's in, in public policy at uh, UCL. Um, I think I think a key dilemma actually is always like for an undergrad, you know, should I? I mean, we've probably got a mixture of undergrad and master's students here, but you know, a key dilemma is should I do a master's? Is it is it worth? It? I think it's definitely worth. It definitely was worthwhile for me to do a master's. Um, I wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing that if I hadn't. But I had, you know, I had, in that sense, I had a kind of short-term plan. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to work in policy, and I knew that kind of a history degree needed a bit of conversion, if you like, to get a bit of um, a bit more currency. So, um, although it didn't quite, I didn't have that, that straight away. I basically worked um, for the uh, Green Party, but I'm very active in, uh, in the Green Party as well politically. Worked for Caroline Lucas for a bit in Parliament. Um, worked in a call centre for a bit. Worked in a pub. Um, and then got the internship. Um, um, yeah, and, so, and I think, I think um, my, in terms of tips, I think part of the kind of you know, the master's thing, I think, with, Doing last, I think, yeah, you know, think about if there's a real, if you can see clearly why it is you're doing it. Apart from that, I think if you want to go into a think tank, you've got to remember that it is still fairly academic, so it is real research, it's primary research, um, and I think it's really valuable. I don't know, if, I wouldn't know if um, if it's key at the recruitment phase, but to have done a dissertation, at least one. So they might not at the recruitment phase. They might, they may or may not really value that. I mean, I'll ask you for examples of where you. Um, done your own primary research, obviously that's a key example of being able to do that. But once you're in the organisation, you'll realise actually, if you've done dissertation, you're like, hang on, that, this is a kind of model that I know because a, you know a, an IPPR standard output, ten thousand words, twenty thousand words for, is very similar to a, you know, a dissertation of primary research. So I think <coughs> having that kind of skill is actually is really, especially once you're through the doors, is really really valuable. So I don't know how you want to do. Question or answer, give a chair or a week is Yeah, yes, you right. can just take two um, <laughs> Could both kind of stand up yeah. place? Um, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions. Yeah. Yeah. How do you keep, um, and this isn't just a question for your particular think tank, but any, any think tank which isn't politically affiliated ideologically, how do you keep a coherent outlook, a coherent sort of agenda if you don't have that affiliation? <laughs> um, so we try and keep the coherence around the ideas rather than the affiliation. So we would never produce two reports that contradicted each other or that um, has as their basis different ideas about the way that society should be. All of our all of our reports and all of our work are at its core based on a, a kind of sound, constant story about 
the way the society should be. Um, and I think everyone, it's important that when people come in, they kind of buy into that uh, and are kind of made aware of it. And uh, it's, it's a gradual thing, like you wouldn't, I'm making it sound a bit like a cult or something, which is, <laughs> but you, like, you know, every, all our work that we do is edited, peer edited. So, for instance, if you came in and you were doing a, your first research report and you were um, writing in a way that was a bit contradictory to the general way of writing, then that would kind of, over time, get ironed out. Um, so, yeah, we yeah we don't align to a political party, we align to kind of a, a set of ideas. I think anything I'd add to that is, um, you know, how does the think tank keep its theme to It's the same way that, you know, uh, if you ask a political party, how does that do it? It has a core set of values. So you don't need a political party to tell you about it. We have our own set of, of values. Um, and we then use that as the basis for developing. It's not just not fixed, they evolve our, our themes, but um, basically we've got a core set of values. Um, yeah. So I'm given the impression that it's quite rare then for the undergraduates to go straight into uh, think tanks. So, um, I can only speak from our, our think tank. I think the, uh, I think, yeah, it is quite rare. I'm not sure that there are any researchers or interns that don't have a master's. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if it's a strict requirement, but um, <coughs> that's the way it is at the moment. But I imagine, I imagine if you had an undergraduate degree without a master's and, you know, uh, a particular, particular set of experiences that put you, put your head above the parapet, then you wouldn't be able to disadvantage. I've heard from first time actually. Um, I think you, there are people there that have a master's. Um, our senior economic analyst doesn't have a master's. He's got an undergraduate degree. But I think, I think it's not a requirement that you go in um, having done a master's. I think it's just the reality of, of everyone else that's applying and to the immediate advantage. Um, I think as well that, um, you, you, I think realistically, you need to either have a master's or you need to have a few years' experience in, in that field after an undergraduate degree. Uh, yeah. So. yeah. Uh, would you say that having a master's at a London university helped you get into that kind of Westminster job, or do you think it doesn't matter where you where you go for your master's? Do you think going to Kings helped you get that job at a think tank? Um, no, not particularly. There are there are people there that did university uh, masters outside of London. Um, I just ended up going there because. Uh, it was a really unique course, and it was the only one that was doing that particular course. Um, so yeah, I suppose the answer is no, I don't think, they don't discriminate on that at all, probably at all. Yeah? Um, I'm just intrigued by your actual specific roles that you've actually gone into when you actually joined the think tank. Because when I've looked at different think tanks and their structures, they've always had like project leaders and then various people kind of working for them. So have you gone, did you go straight into research? Or was it kind of working as a team, or like they yeah, just kind of specific roles you know, and kind of contributed to anything? Yeah, um, so yeah, the largest body of employees are researchers, but they have a kind of, um, I mean, we have, we're not very hierarchical, but we have a kind of um, different tiers. So we've got social directors who are responsible for a team that's around the net age and mathematic area, um, and they kind of really work on, um, yeah, basically from my early kind of arranging that theme, making sure everything's fit together and piece it. And we've got research fellows, senior research fellows, and then researchers at the, uh, the bottom of that ladder. But it's kind of, it's, as I said, it's not very hierarchical. So, and you can come into a think tank at any point, depending on your experience. I think if you've only got a degree, you're realistically only really going to come in as a researcher, unless you've got a PhD. Maybe. Um, <coughs> but in terms of how you're actually working, it will, it will depend. So, some projects. They're very small, you might do it on your own um, entirely. Normally, they'd be working with at least one other person um, on a particular um, paper or something. Um, and then sometimes that will fit into a broader theme, which might have half a dozen people working on it. Uh, yeah, so my, when I first arrived at IPPR, I went straight to working on a project uh, that was just me and my uh, line manager. So he was what's called a senior research fellow. So kind of two rounds of me and a researcher. Uh, and yeah, we worked 
we worked together on it for six or so months. Um, and then, so it normally works that you might have a core project that you're working on long term like that, but you might also be expected to, to dip in and help out with other people's research projects. So you might spend two weeks um, looking into, uh, I spent a few, few weeks looking into long term health conditions for someone else's project. Uh, so that's the kind of way it works. <coughs> Yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, with regards to funding, how do you manage being stay neutral and also having uh, a source of income that comes from you know, people who have a certain agenda? Yeah, uh, so we are funded by um, charitable donations from people and organisations. Uh, so we have a small team that are specifically geared towards raising funds. Uh, we won't accept, I think I'm right in saying, we won't accept funds. Um, we don't accept funding on the basis that we should come up with a particular argument or a particular uh, view. We accept funds to do a project on a, uh, to look into something, but then what we, the recommendations that we come up with are, aren't able to be influenced by the people that funded the project. So uh, it might be that certain organisations would be less likely to fund us if they thought that the things we were going to come up with would be contrary to what they would want us to come up with, and those people just, they would never give us money. So it kind of works that way. I think it comes back to that kind of like, how do you know what your values are as well? So I think, because the funding can work both ways, so people come to us, it's kind of the scenario you've picked, so people come to us and say, oh, you know, we want X, Y, and Z done, and we'll only accept that if we happen to our interests align with X, Y, and Z as well. If we've got a reason for wanting to know that as well. Mm -hmm. But actually, a lot of the funding we get, we go out looking for it. So we've got a program of research. We've got ideas that we want to develop. We've got policy niches we think we've identified, and we'll think, right, who else cares about this? You know, is it shelter? Is it another charity? Is it a trust? Is it a, is it a company? A picture industry? Um, who else cares about the values that we've identified for that particular area? And we'll go out and find funding for it. So, um, yeah, all the issues that you look into, the policy issues, are they only specific to Britain? That's question one. And question two is, um, do you hire international students who might need to work in it for full-time positions? What was the second question? Do you hire? Um, international students who might need to work for for full-time positions? Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, I don't know. <coughs> I mean, I don't know what technicality is. No, I, I don't know if that will work kind of thing. Um, I think, I mean, you need to be able to obviously have permission to work in the UK, but I think that do, if, if, if you're the best person for the job, they'll, they'll you know, <coughs> shift on and over to make it happen. You know? So I think, I don't know about technicality of the employment law. Um, but, um, uh, and what was the first part of the question again? Yeah, are the policy issues only related to British politics? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they're not. Um, so also we've got a British focus, because we're a British think tank. But um, we do a whole lot of work across Europe, so it is, it's fairly Eurocentric and, and, and North America, uh, definitely. It's not, it's not got a great world uh, view in that sense, but it's at least in my experience. Um, but um, it's very international, but it does go right across Europe. We've got a big program of work looking at jobs and skills across the EU. Um, so yeah, Europe and OECD countries is a fair bit of international work. Yeah, and we tend to do uh, kind of comparative studies where we compare the UK, the, situa the situation in the UK to um, other countries. We, we would do much less in um, talking about other countries kind of specifically without relating to the UK. Yeah. Uh, I understand that you probably need like a policy background you know, to work in the research team, but when it comes to, for example, comms and events, is it, what kind of background do you normally look for people for that? Um, I think I think expertise in that area. So you wouldn't. I think I think. Um, I mean, for start, you don't need to have a policy background to get into the research. Right. You need to have a research background, or at least, yeah, um, or degree, you know, degree that can demonstrate research knowledge. I think the policy side of it is something they're looking for, but won't necessarily have asked you to have done that before. Because the in the industry, the think industry is not very big, so you can't expect just to take on what you've already worked in it. Um, I think I'm right in saying that um, it's pretty much the same for all the areas of comms. Um, uh, Fundraising, all of it will be a case of you know, have you got 
can you do that job in any organisation? And any knowledge of how open the policy space, the deployments are going to have to get up to speed of it anyway to be able to back in the organisation. But so, no, not, so, not necessarily this. <coughs> Right, right at the back. Um, I don't think this is a bit rude to ask, but how's the UK going to work? Um, I'd say it's, it's okay, but it's not great. Particularly <laughs> <laughs> uh, in London, it's not, it's not, uh, yeah, you should, definitely shouldn't go into it if you're after a high paid career. But it's better, it, yeah, it's okay. It's better than a call centre. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's, char it's a charity, so it's a charity sector, so it's not. It's not like, not stupidly low, but I don't know, because I've got enough jobs. <laughs> uh, yeah? yeah it, uh, it doesn't sound like either of your um, bachelor's or master's degree degrees were particularly quantitative. I don't know how you said it it's public policy, what the focus is there. Um, but what sort of quantitative background do you need <coughs> to work at IPPR? What are you looking for? So I'm, I do a lot of quantitative work. Um, my master's was very well. It, it had the option in it to make it very quant heavy, because um, obviously history isn't at all. Um, so I did do a whole lot of kind of um, yeah quant research methods and did a whole dissertation on that. Um, but you don't it's certainly not something you need. Um, I think most think tanks will recognise that they want to have you know, a, bit of a mini quant team inside it because it expands what they can do massively. Um, but I, the vast majority of researchers there have no background. At all, um, because it really is about it's about ideas and policy and that kind of creativity side as much as the analytic side. And the quant side really is mainly analytic and looking at how things are now. Um, except when we're doing modelling, cut policy proposals. So that's the only. So um, uh, certainly, I think it's an asset. I think there are a few people out there who've got quant skills, um, but it's certainly not a requirement. It depends what the depends what they're looking for, what they're recruiting. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, no ideas. I did very minimal amounts of quant in my degrees, uh, but now that I'm in IBPR, you know, uh, in a couple of weeks I'm going to the day's training to learn how to use um, some modeling software. So there's opportunities once you're in to kind of expand on, uh, expand on what you're good at. Um, can you go a bit more into that? And also, um, for your work, which heavily influences like policy and institutions, how often do you work with management consultants? Uh, so, on the first half of the question about experts, we would talk to literally anyone who's got a reputation as being an expert in a particular field. So, for a program, for a piece of work on uh, mental health. We, we would talk to uh, psychiatrists, we would talk to top people in the NHS, we would talk to social workers, we would talk to uh, leading the chief execs of Minds and the mental health charities. So by experts, uh, we just mean anyone who's um, got a strong reputation within that particular field. Um, second part of the question on management consultants. Uh, <coughs> Sure. I think at times the various teams might outsource some micro roles, but it's not, we don't use consultants heavily. We, I think, and I think that might be a bit, I mean, IPPR is one of the biggest think tanks in the country, so we do have the most things in house. Yeah, so like after we said, we have kind of a, a team that's geared up to do more quant work, uh, and we obviously have the commons team, the events team, and so we have yeah, publications, so we. We're big enough that we can cover most things in the house. Okay. The reason why I ask that is you have a medical consultant, they go in, they assess the market value or whatever, the type of business, and they say that they recommend this you go in this type of way. Right. But obviously, if you guys are continually coming in with different policies, yeah. you guys are going to butt heads. Yeah, so we don't have anyone coming in and telling us that kind of stuff. We do, we do all of that thinking about our own strategies and stuff ourselves. Because in a way, we're doing that job for government. So if we have someone to do that job for us, we should be able to do that. Um, in terms of like talking to experts as well, because um, I think like, it's really easy to slip into just kind of by experts just talking about um, what are they describe policy wonks or these people in the Westminster bubble, where it's really important to recognise that for something like childcare policy, 
an expert isn't just the kind of the, the council and the people delivering that service and the civil servants in Westminster which are it's also the mum and dads that are using it. You know, the people that are the end user. They're also experts on large part of the policy <coughs> because you know, how's it actually benefiting people around this. So I think in terms of talking to experts, we do try and recognise that experts come in all sorts of sizes and shapes as well. <coughs> Yeah, I'm having a look at your corporate partners uh, page, and it says that you know you give dedicated attention and personalised service to you know your corporate partners. I was wondering that since JP Morgan has given three times more money to you guys than anyone else, what sort of dedicated attention do you guys give those guys whilst maintaining independence? I just wondering. Uh, so the, the JP Morgan uh, funded the project that Alfie mentioned about European jobs and skills. And it's, it's the largest amount of funding because it's the largest project. So I think for that project in particular, we held, uh, I think it was, a, I wasn't involved with it personally, but it was a, like a whole day conference, uh, which was run jointly with um, JP Morgan. And, uh, and we produced a, a kind of a really hefty report that was almost like a book um, about European jobs and skills. So I think the, uh, the care and attention uh, just equates to the amount of work that obviously if they give us more money, they expect more outputs from us. Uh, so I think that's just the connection there, it's nothing underhanded. I, I think like on a given report you give, you know, your, if, if it depends on how things are up, if the funder, if you you know, identify the funder which has got interests that are aligned or if you on the basis of getting funding you um, you, know, you kind of have a working relationship then that's what determines the dedication of the um, whatever the phrase you read out so that kind of the closest of that relationship. So um, you know with JP Morgan you know you wouldn't give them more attention because they paid more money. So like creative the money is the biggest one because it's over three years. It's not because they paid for, for privileged um, access to the organisation. So they just literally they'll be funding tens of papers for over three years. Um, but the kind of the unit, the amount they're giving for the paper is no bigger than anyone else. You don't get any special relationship. Okay. I noticed that um, the King's College London Masters in Public Policy includes accredited internship. Do you happen to know if there are many Masters students who do an internship with the IPTR as part of their degree? Uh, no, I know. I don't think. Though I did. Um, so um, <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't part. Of, it wasn't part of the degree. But, um, it wasn't part of the degree, but um, uh, IPPR co-funded an internship with UCR, um, and so that's and as a UCR student, you, you're obviously you're the first one to hear about it. Um, but it's not. Um, it's not part of the degree. It's not part of the course. Um, it's just. It's just usually how to fund it, so they have publicised it to their students. <coughs> Most internships are. Um, they're basically short-term job contracts. Um, they're all paid. Um, they'll all be a fixed-term contract. They don't have any. Um, you know, we've got work experience programs, mm. but, um, but no internships are a bit different. So I don't think there are any. Um, there's no university courses that are kind of having internships that are part of that course. It's, Normally they're funded in Let me know you say that you're, you, you, you come to uh, try and be neutral. Um, the, out, and the outcome of your research, you might have, you might say, for example, that you want to increase taxes, and you've come, you've come to that conclusion in a sort of neutral fashion. Yeah. But that might still disagree. So for example, the Conservative, their ideology that they would disagree with them. Yeah. So how do you manage that and how do you get how do you basically get parties from very different ideologies to to listen to them? So I think it's it's inevitable that some if you are a think tank that has a particular set of values and uh, understanding of the world, but it's inevitable that some parties are more likely to listen to than others. So it might be that um, uh, a particular party might only 
uh, and take on your recommendations in certain areas. It might be that some parties won't take in any of your recommendations because it's so distant from where you're coming from. Um, I, I think that's just an inevitable reality of being a think tank. But you are unlikely to appeal to all people equally. Yeah, I just think anything to add a bit, just force of the argument. So we've got our values, we will write policy to try and fit those and we've written that policy in that way because we think it's substantiated by the evidence by our careful process of developing that policy. So we're then, having done that, we'll just argue We're not going to try and, we don't kind of tailor it to go to whichever government at the time. Values remain constant and it's just, we try to force an argument that we want to see a better policy. Um, what, what I had a dream in Excel spreadsheets once. It's not really an brilliant answer, but I, something that I find quite annoying is that there's so much going on, so many different areas of interesting work that it's difficult to kind of acknowledge that you can't be across everything all the time and it's quite frustrating sometimes to have to think I'm doing this particular project on this thing I know all these other things that are going on that I'd quite like to be involved in as well but can't do it all yeah well not, not so much managing the time just um, coming to terms with being a, a researcher in a particular scene <coughs> and um, that you can't cover you personally individually can't cover everything but then the flip side of that is that you know, because there's loads going on and because you're not necessarily going to be working and everything, it is actually great to be working around it. So there'll be events going on all the different fields, really key speakers key, key coming in from all different areas. So you can actually kind of you can get get filled for a lot of things that you wouldn't otherwise do. I don't know what must have done. I think I haven't been there long enough and be irritated yet. Still quite some mistakes. Yeah. Do we have um, like two last questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was briefly mentioned beforehand since you said like you do research in, on, you know, in or on other European countries as well. I was just wondering how much you, you know, you go out of the Westminster bubble and also try and go into the Brussels bubble as well. And if so, um, you know, do you network with other think tanks as well? Is there any sort of cooperation or if you will, rivalry or, you know, how, how's the relationship to other think tanks? Do, do you actually form like an academic network? Um, so there are examples where we, would co where we collaborate with other international think tanks. So I think there's a, a project going on in the energy and climate change team where um, IPPI is one of several think tanks from around the world that are doing this uh, long, long-standing piece of work. Uh, so I think once every six months or so, about three researchers will jet off to China and meet up with these uh, Dutch think tank people, Finnish think tank people. Uh, so there are examples of where that happens. Uh, in terms of the Brussels question, I'm not sure if we, I'm not sure if we do do much in Brussels to be honest. I think it's. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we do. No, I'm not enough. I think a lot of a lot of the international work we do, it will be with a view to what can we do in the UK. So the policy recommendations will be generally speaking for the UK. I mean, for the um, Jake Morgan project that was, that was mentioned, um, that's jobs and skills across Europe. So our, our recommendations are Europe wide, but. That isn't yet, it's only in the first phase of that, so we haven't yet got to that final phase where we're going into the really detailed policy stuff, we're still in the analytic phase. So I don't think we've really done a lot, in, 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 as far as I'm um, in Brussels. And in terms of the rivalries, I think it's all, it's all quite friendly. There's, uh, there's like a think tank awards once a year, so we'll meet somewhere. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's too much of a <coughs> Yeah, finally. You guys must have thought about going into the public sector, so what is the appeal of the think tank over the public sector? You mean civil service? Yes, yeah, civil service. 
Um, I think, well, for me personally, but um, for me, it was that if you're working in the public sector, your um, theoretical, very much the kind of the po politics, if you like, and the um, philosophy behind it, is handed down to you. You're working on behalf of others. Uh, whichever government might be, come in, whichever minister or whatever is running a department, um, and you don't have a formal, you're not supposed to have a formal input into that, kind of that ideas in the back of it. Whereas in the um, technical <coughs> you are doing both. You're part of that ideas machine, you're part of thinking about what is what is good and bad, what values do we care about, as well as the policy side. And I think, because um, I, I thought about doing kind of like civil service fast track or something like that, but it would only be. I would only done it as well as you trying to get out again to get it back into the third sector, into charities and just, because that's with my values that's aligned with the organisation as well. Yeah, I think um, in the civil service unless you can it's not strictly true, but unless you can get into kind of strategy <coughs> or that kind of thing, I think um, then it's difficult to have the kind of thing that I've been talking about about um, you know, thinking about ideas and and positioning politically, politically and theoretically, it's more uh, you know administering a certain thing. As well. So that's what I was <coughs> more geared towards the think tank. Just say that there is a bit of a revolving door in the centre because I think you've got about you've got like three or four people who are currently um, it's a problem with things at the service mm -hmm. and then may or may not come back. Um, so you know, people do go between the two quite easily. The work is very similar in most regards, so um, it's not like you have to choose one or the other. You know, so they're very much in the same in the same space. Well, thanks very much.